My nana and grandpa were not very rich, although they, at least they didn't appear to be, financially speaking, that is. They never threw anything out, even things they probably should have thrown out. They used it up, stretched it out, made it do or did without. That was the family motto. It echoes through my father today still. Therefore, you had to be careful what you ate at Nana's house. Us grandkids had a rule of thumb. Nothing fresh, just sugar. Sugar doesn't go off, and there's plenty of it on offer at Nana's. Just go for the chocolate slice with the coconut sprinkle in the rusting tin. If it's hot, maybe grab a DIY ice block with the plastic reusable handles in those clear, let's face it, brown molds. You gotta lick them quickly, get through the freezer taste, and then eventually they come good because let's face it, they're nearly undiluted cordial. But the main routine was check the fizz on the cola. Not the Coke, the cola. And if that was uh, alive, we were good to go. There were parts of my nana and grandpa's house that were like a museum, a throwback to yesteryear. The problem is those parts I'm talking about were the fridge and the pantry. Some of the labels on that food had just hieroglyphics on papyrus. It was that old. It didn't matter, though, we had sugar. We stuck to it. Nana and Grandpa didn't seem rich, but their lives were rich, spiritually and socially rich. They would talk for hours around the dinner table or in the lounge room around the fireplace about people that they knew and had ministered to, people that they loved and people who loved them. They'd given their lives to these people. Many different people. But first and foremost, they'd given their lives to Christ and serving Him. They were always beaming to see the family, especially me. At least that's how it felt to me. As the car would pull into their yard, and I would get out and run and jump into their arms for a cuddle, I could almost see their heart radiating behind their eyes with joy. Later on, as the years went by, the same car would pull into the same yard and I'd get out all cool with the sunnies and the mullet and saunter up for a hug. Yes, the mullet, they're not new. I rocked mine with Jason Donovan and Craig McLaughlin in the 80s. Whenever we'd have Christmas at Nana's, we'd have the time of our lives, the cousins. They had this vegetable patch out the back of the yard that Grandpa had built, and it had all strawberries and other things there. And we'd be like picking and playing and pegging half-rotten fruit over the fence and smashing it against the fence. It was a great time, if you weren't my Nana's neighbor. There was an old retro caravan in their driveway. We were allowed to go into that. In fact, we were allowed to go anywhere on the property except grandpa's study. But we got into that old caravan full of, it was piled up with outfits, dresses and hats and toys and all sorts of random stuff. We would just put those on and do skits and jokes, probably Nana's dresses. And eventually we'd hear the call back into the house. Lunch was over, but now it's time for pudding, Christmas pudding. A pudding which my nana had baked into it one and two cent pieces. It was fun sitting at the table looking around at each other, waiting for someone's teeth to chink on an old tarnished coin as they would lick the custard off that coin and place it next to their plate with all the other coins that accumulated. No one got rich. But no one died, and that's the true miracle of that lunch. But, 
But everyone was full of joy because Nana had given herself to us fully in all the traditions and all the ways that we cherished. We felt full when we left Nana and Grandpa's house. Not full of food, we weren't that crazy. We stuck to the sugar and coins, but full in the heart. We did present time, and it wasn't even the highlight of the day. For kids, on Christmas Day, present time was not the highlight. We knew we'd get some daggy or maybe irrelevant present from Nana. One time I shaved my head. It was just a little longer than it is today, which is nothing. And Nana gave me a comb for Christmas. It was hilarious, but it wasn't a practical joke. We all cracked up. She eventually worked out why we were laughing so much. And she said to me, don't worry, pet. You just put that away until you need it. It's still away. I don't know when I'll need it. You know, the point is this. When I look back on those days, those Christmases of my childhood, I don't recall feeling that anyone in the world gave me more than my nana did. The presents were, with all due respect, not memorable. Except the comb. That's legendary. But how was it that I felt that way? I felt that way at that time. As a young materialistic boy, which all boys would be, probably. Why was I so fulfilled leaving Nana's place? It's because she gave more. She gave more than presents. She gave more than food. She gave herself. She gave herself first to Christ and then to others. And she lived for others. So did my grandpa. And so did their son, my dad, like exceptionally. When Nana gave herself to me, it was in the context of her giving herself fully to Christ in worship. And so being in the presence of my Nana was like being in the presence of Christ himself. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and demonstrated all the fruits of that. She would always make room at the table for kids. We were crazy, but we weren't a nuisance. She always wanted to hear from the kids. It wasn't a token gesture. She always thought about kids as having intrinsic value and worth. And she added value to us. She would ask us about our school, about our uh, dreams, about our friends and our sports and our church. What do you mean, our church? You mean mum and dad's church? She'd say, no, your church, your Sunday school. Who's teaching you? What did you learn? What's your favorite verse? Who are your friends at church? She would relay information about other cousins to us and no doubt us to other cousins if we weren't at the same gathering. I always found out what Christy was up to or what Glenn had you know, um, won or was awarded or Dave was doing. She loved us. Now my Nana, she spent less on Christmas, that's for sure. But she really did give more. And I'm not grading her giving against others giving as though they're not up to her standard. What I'm saying is that my Nana gave more than what she lacked in financial and material gifts. And that's the opportunity before all of us today, this Advent season, as we consider that. It costs more, but it's worth so much more to give ourselves to others. As we explore this movement of the Advent conspiracy this year, we're encouraged to worship fully, that was two weeks ago, to spend less, Neil talked about that last week, to give more, we're talking about today, and to love all. Giving at Christmas can ironically be so shallow and meaningless. And I say ironically because... 
There's nothing shallow or meaningless about God's gift to the world, which Christmas is all about, is there? Is our giving in the same vein as God's? That's the question we're asking ourselves these weeks. And we might shudder to think or consider our giving as superficial, shallow or meaningless. But then we calculate things like we go to East Gardens and we say, okay, they usually get something from me each year, so I better pick something up for them. Wow. What a way to give from the heart, huh? What about, oh, they spent this much on me and I've only got them that, so I better go and get something else because their gift was worth more money than mine. Deep. How about I feel bad if I don't get them something? Is that the best we can do? Give gifts in an unappreciated attempt to alleviate personal guilt? (laughs) How about this one? I know they're doing it tough this year, so I'll get them a gift. Now, that sounds like the right thing to do. And I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do. But what we're doing here this year, in the Advent conspiracy, as we consider this recalibration to our approach, is to say, you know what? I know that person's doing it tough this year. And I'm not sure that they need a gift more than they need me. So I'm going to give myself to that person this year in a meaningful way. We might say this year, I'm not going to feel bad because someone bought me a gift. Instead, I'm going to show them actually how much I appreciate them along with the gift. I'm having them over for dinner. My gift will be my time and a glass of wine and a spag bowl or a steak or whatever. Toast. We might say, I don't have enough money to reciprocate these gifts that I was given. But it's not about that. I've been so blessed by this person that, you know what, I'm going to make something for them that actually communicates their worth. They might not get that from anywhere else in the world. And it might be what they need more than anything in the world. Relational gifts are in view when we're saying, give more. At Christmas, because we just said spend less. The three pastors who spawned this Advent conspiracy years ago tell of a story of two young women uh, giving their nana, whom they were not able to spend a lot of time with because of distance, a precious gift. It consisted of a big mason jar full of colourful bits of paper, 52 of them in, in fact, And the instruction was pretty clear and simple. Nana, every Monday, make a cup of tea, pull out one page, one bit of paper, and read it. On each one of those bits of brightly coloured papers was recounting a time that these two great-granddaughters had grown up under the love and care of this Nana and what that meant to them. I remember you walking me around the pond and feeding the ducks, Nana. What a time, blah, blah. 52 of those. Monday morning, no doubt, became Nana's favourite time of the week. A moment of nostalgia, yes, of course, but a time of worship as well, as she thanked God for those beautiful great-granddaughters. They too undertook to think of her on Monday mornings, sometimes connect and often, always, hopefully, pray for one another. God was making a connection between these generations, a vibrant, real connection, with a mason jar full of colourful paper. Now that's giving more, isn't it? I believe God's calling us to be giving more, intentionally and relationally. I think the world needs it more than ever. They don't need more stuff. We can buy whatever we want. Yeah? We need people's time. We need their energy. We need their ear. We need their company. 
We, we need to give people our talents and our presence as we worship Christ. It's both and. Spend less, give more. It sounds obvious, yet we seem to do drifting so easily from that liberating and straightforward truth. And the truth is this. The Father gave his one and only Son. John 3.16 for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's Christmas. That's it. That's its meaning. God's answer to the world's problems was not more stuff. It's never been material things. Even good stuff like work and family and health and food. God gave himself. That's his gift. Highly relational. The most priceless and personal of all gifts. When we give relationally at the Advent season, that's what we remember. That's the opportunity to worship him as we remind one another what gift he gave. Do you think it's possible that we forget how relational God's gift is to us? Because God gives us heaps of stuff too, right? Sometimes I think it's possible to forget how relational his true gift is. Christ is the treasure. Knowing him and having him in our lives is far better than the stuff God gives, isn't it? Isn't it? That's the question that will begin to uncover where our hearts are at. That's a great question because we want to uncover truth and respond accordingly. Would we be just as happy with the stuff that God gives us without the God who gives it to us? All the blessings in life. If we had them but God said, I'm going to go now, would we be just as happy as we are today? The beach, the friends, the parties, the music, the holidays, the whatever. If Christ is in our heart as supreme treasure over and against all competing treasures in life, then we will be relational recipients of true tre treasure and relational givers of ourselves. That's this hope. Look at what the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians. He says, look, I'm ready to come to you this third time. I will not burden you since I am not seeking what is yours, but you. I want you. I'm not seeking what is yours, but you. You can't give me anything more important than you or that I want more than you. What a Christ-like approach to giving oneself to the mission of God Paul had. Isn't that what we're celebrating at Christmas? The giving of oneself? That's what God did. The mission of God was to give himself in the most profound and loving way to live and to die that we might die and live. That's the gift. When we realize that God has given himself to us in this way, we take up the mission of Christ, just like Paul and just like many, many others. And at that point, it's only natural that we become relational givers. After all, our mission from God is reconciling relationships to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not seeking what is yours, but you says Paul. They're beautiful words of a man giving more. He's giving more. But surely those words could not be Paul's if the spirit of those words was not first Christ's. They're God's words. I want to reflect on that for a minute. 
Because the whole concept of giving more that we're talking about, giving more of ourselves is relational giving in the light of Christ, right? He's the ultimate relational gift. So how does God approach giving in the context of Paul's words to the Corinthians, which are actually God's words? So now I want you to hear those words from God. When God says to us, I'm not seeking what is yours, but you. What does that tell us about God? It tells us that he wants a deep and meaningful, relational giving and receiving. He wants a real relationship. That is fitting of Christmas because nothing's more clearly demonstrated at Christmas. Therefore, nothing is more fitting of the Christian life. You can't have a Christian life. I don't think it's a real Christian life if you don't want deep, meaningful, true, real, living relationship with God. Other than that, you only have religion. And you can sing that song and dance that dance and never meet God. He gave us his son. Not so we'd give him 10% of our income. Not so that we'd give him our Saturday mornings and our Wednesday nights and our songs and our sermons. He doesn't want what is ours but us. He wants us. Our hearts. And he doesn't have our hearts if he doesn't have our obedience and our affections. Kim Jong-un's got obedience, but he doesn't have affections from any sane person, probably. (laughs) God wants both. That's how we know we want God. Obedience and affections. He goes deeper than mere obedience. It's a matter of the heart for God. The question is, are we growing people in this regard? We might not have hearts overwhelmed and overflowing and bursting with allegiance. But do we want to go deeper? Do we want to grow? Or we couldn't give a rip what we do, as long as we do what we want. Let's consider how we can give more of ourselves to Christ as we give more of ourselves to each other. That's what's in view when we say give more. John 13, 35 says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. That's what we're talking about when we say give more. Everyone will know we're his disciples when we, how we give. Listen to what God says. In those words, he says, I seek you. That's what he's saying when he's saying, I don't want what is yours, I want you. He's saying, I seek you. He means not only for my love, but for my tools, for my instruments. That's why I want, I seek you to carry out the purposes for which I died. He wants us. And what are those purposes? If they are not, in essence, relational gifts to the glory of God. That's what God seeks. He wants us for. For his love and for his instruments. Giving relational gifts to the world. Can you imagine seeing anyone? Or can you imagine anyone seeing Jesus for who he is? I mean, well beyond the baby in the manger on the Christmas cards and at the nativity scene, but seeing who he is, the master of the universe, the creator of heavens and earth, the author and the perfecter of our faith, our full payment for sin, the lover of our soul, our daily bread, our living water, our intercessor before the Father, in constant presence as we walk through this Valley of the shadow of death daily, in some way or another, even if only emotionally. Can you imagine anyone realizing 
who our Christmas gift is in any deep and real sense and then responding by living the rest of our lives dumb and idle to the work of God. Can you imagine that? You see him for who he is, you acknowledge him as Lord and Saviour, and you do nothing. Nothing in the work of God. Imagine that. Christmas is a cosmic declaration from the Father saying, I am not seeking what is yours but you. I want you. For my love and for my instruments in the mission of giving more. So give more. Give more. I'm not saying don't buy presents. Buy me as many presents as you want. No. <laughs> Give more. Give more of ourselves. Lastly, I hope we can hear the Holy Spirit of Christmas, God, saying to us, I'm seeking you and what is yours, actually. Giving more starts and ends with God. The purpose of his mission is not that he would have us without what is ours. And for that matter, and probably worse, that we, he would have what is ours, but actually never really have us. Giving ourselves to God without giving him title of all of our possessions and all of our endeavours and relationships and dreams is extremely questionable. But giving God our possessions, when it doesn't flow from a heart of worship and a giving of ourselves in allegiance, that actually amounts to absolutely nothing. Keep it. Keep it. Don't give to God anything you're holding of His when you're not going to give yourself. <laughs> What's the point? Keep it. Should that truth not inform, firstly, how we respond to God's gift to us? And secondly, how we give gifts to each other at Christmas? If self-surrender is to run through the whole Christian life, shouldn't we be known by our giving and namely that we give more? We think about it and we give ourselves. And it's not just Christmas, by the way. It's a life of service. It's more than balancing the books on the value of the present I received. It's more than a conscious clearing, reciprocation of a present because you got me one. It's more than out of debt incurring duress <laughs> because, oh no, I have to. We give ourselves fully to Christ first and then it's a joy to give ourselves to the world around us. And let me tell you, the world around us is desperate for someone to give them something of more substance than just what will end up in the bin by next Christmas. What does it mean to give more? That you should give more? How should you go about this? I don't know. I don't even know what it means for me. I don't... My wife and I have been talking about ideas that are pretty exciting. One idea that I had last week when Neil was preaching was about distributing how we spend on our kids and maybe that would free up as much money to spend on these, these cards for kids on the other side of the world that don't have anything. Maybe. Another idea was to bl bless a child that we've supported by the grace of God who's now come of age this year and he's off to university and maybe giving him a gift. Another idea is visiting people around here that we know are lonely and disconnected and investing in them time. Then, of course, the greatest gift we could give them as a family is to leave. 
all our kids. Give them some peace. That's just the gift that keeps on giving, right? Jonathan talks this morning about an opportunity for us to give ourselves. Church starts at 9 that day instead of 9.30. We do set the alarm. We do wake up and get here early. And we forgo the conversation with the familiar friends we talk to every week. And we do have our eyes open and up looking for people coming to blue Christmas, broken and busted, disconnected, that they would connect with us. Because it's not about us, it's about them. Maybe that's what we give more this year. Who's going to live for others as they live for Christ? Who's growing in that way? Who's willing to be knowing people in that way? Who's willing to give more this Christmas? Who among us knows that God's law of self-surrender in its application to our possessions implies that there should be an element of sacrifice in them? Whether we're talking about the possession of our intellect or the possession of our influence or position or power or material wealth, that really hard one to let go of. The law of giving is sacrifice. God demonstrates that as well. And the law for the true Christian is to not offer to the Lord that which costs us nothing. He didn't offer us anything that cost him nothing. We know we shouldn't offer him anything that costs us nothing. So the question remains... Who of us is going to reach the world for Christ this Christmas by giving everything we can to his church? His church at Maroubra and the appointments that he provides with the people who are desperate for hope around here, our community, our people. The question's not rhetorical. We have an open door before us. There are so many things in the next month that you can get engaged with, that need energy, time, expertise, commitment, inconvenience. Let's be people who give more as we walk by faith and not by sight.